thank you all for coming. I, I can see more and more people streaming in um, through the through the uh, waiting room, but I think we'll make a start because we've got a lot to get through and it's a, it's a tight old schedule today. And um, I see we're up against uh, meditation with Satish Kumar, among some other fantastic sessions as well. So a tough billing uh, at LRFC this year, as, as every year. Um, and, and I really do appreciate so many of you uh, joining today to help us answer some, I think, you know, very, very important questions. Can I just draw your attention um, to the chat where I think the code of conduct will be posted if it has not already been. Um, please just keep your mics uh, muted and your videos off until the breakouts, which will be coming in the second half of the session. Thank you. My name is Jim Scone. I'm the Farming Transition Co-Lead at the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, working on the transition to agroecology and more regenerative farming systems by 2030. Today, and with your help, we're going to talk through the ways we can make this transition accessible for all farms and farm businesses across the four nations of the United Kingdom. Now, those of you familiar with the FFCC's work will know that over the last 12 months, the Farming for Change research which has given us a model that shows an agroecological UK is achievable and desirable. And our Farming Smarter reports have set out the business case for this transition. But now is the time to move beyond the modelling, to get stuck into the detail. What does the future of farming look like in your region? Where do farms and farm businesses need to get to for a thriving, sustainable future in your place? What tools and resources do farmers need that they don't currently have to achieve this? And how would this work across different kinds and sizes of enterprise? And what can farmers do that they're not already doing to make uh, the necessary changes? We've got a great panel of speakers uh, to help us answer these questions and talk through their experiences of this transition to explain where they are trying to get their farm businesses to. We'll hear from Johnny Balfour, Nick Renison, Luke Wilson and Nick Francis in a moment. In the second half of the session, we'll move into breakout rooms to hear your thoughts and comments. There will be three rooms focusing on upland, grassland and lowland arable farming. So have a think about which interests you most and to which you'd like to contribute. But first, to get us into these conversations, to move from the modelling to the reality of the farming transition, let me give a five minute update on what the latest research says about an agroecological UK. We launched the first phase of the Farming for Change research at ORFC last January and published the latest modelling in November. The model establishes that it is plausible and feasible to feed the UK with a shift to agroecology. I'm going to remind us briefly of the ways this transition can restore nature, tackle climate change and improve our health with a more balanced and nutritional diet with viable farm businesses driving these changes. And though George Eustace was focusing on England in his OFC speech a moment ago, it's really worth emphasising this is a blueprint that can deliver against all the priorities he set out and can do so across the four nations of the UK. Now please bear with me for a moment while I share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see this now. The Farming for Change data I'm about to show you is from IDRI's work on modelling an agroecological UK in 2050. And the full report can be found on the FFCC website and may be helpfully put in the chat any moment. There's plenty there um, that I won't have time to cover today. So please take a look at that if you have questions. Like all good models, it raises uh, many questions as well as answering them. Uh, we'll share these slides too, so you can look at them at your leisure. And I'll keep this on the browser as you see it here, as it will be easier to point out the key areas with my cursor uh, to hopefully make this clear on your Hoover and Zoom screens. So, in this first graphic, we're seeing how farmland is currently used across the whole of the UK in percentage terms. It's not a very diverse picture. There's lots of permanent grassland, which we'd expect given this is the dominant landscape that we have across the UK. But there's also a high proportion of fodder crops, more surprising given we've clearly got plenty of grass to feed ruminant livestock. Now, this is how things have changed after the 2050 transition. At first glance, things might not seem so different, but there are important changes here. It's a more diverse and balanced picture. Pulses and legumes increase considerably, while permanent grassland, though increasing 
uh, they're decreasing, I should say, in percentage terms, still accounts for the majority of UK farmland. Now, these changes allow synthetic nitrogen to be phased out. This is possible, the model shows, by carefully husbanding nutrients with livestock and by integrating legumes into rotations. So as these crops fix nitrogen in the soil, ruminant livestock cycle and supply organic nitrogen in manure, the cornerstone of mixed farming systems. And farming more mixed landscapes that allow a greater number and diversity of insects, birds and mammals to flourish helps to control pests without the use of herbicides and pesticides, which are also eliminated from UK farming in this agroecological future. Striking too is that land for ponds, trees, hedges and fallow on farms doubles. You can see that there. And a further 1.2 million hectares can be dedicated to increasingly high nature value farming, peatland restoration, woodland, and to re-establish species evolved for non-agricultural habitats. In total, 10% even 11% of current agricultural land can be used to restore ecosystems for nature and climate recovery. Which brings us to how an agroecological UK reduces emissions. So here we see the emissions from farming in 2010 set against the emissions from an agroecological farming sector in 2050. Now it's important to note that this 2050 figure is variable depending on the amount of land given for high nature value farming, woodlands and peatland restoration. Decisions that I must stress and as we all know need to be made with the people living and farming that land. In terms of climate, agroecological farming really comes into its own when we include its sequestration potential. Here we see the net emissions from 2010 and 2050 once more, but with the carbon captured and stored in farmland taken into account. And this remains, I think, a conservative estimate for an agroecological UK. I think we should be aiming for agriculture to become a net carbon store, in fact, as regenerative farming practices develop and our knowledge increases. This move to more mixed farming, built around rotational cropping, livestock on the land and reduced synthetic inputs, also sees changes to the UK diet. Here we see a breakdown of the average diet currently consumed in the UK. So there's relatively few vegetables and fruits, quite a lot of sugar, and high proportions too of milk products and beverages. These are all shown here in grams per day. But as land for horse sustainable horticulture doubles, so more and better fruits and vegetables, as you can see here, vegetables and fruits increasing quite dramatically, as well as nuts and pulses, really is the foundation of a healthy and affordable diet for the 77.5 million people projected to live in the UK by 2050. And while we talk about less but better meat, excuse me, it's important to distinguish between the consumption of beef and sheep, which stays broadly similar, because of the important role ruminants play in cycling nutrients and pork and poultry, which drops considerably as these animals are farmed less intensively in more mixed systems. Now, these changes don't really show up too clearly here, but again, we'll share these slides so you can toggle between these uh, two slides and, and see these changes more clearly for yourselves if you'd like to. And while focusing on meat is of course important, we must also examine intensive plant-based systems where there's huge danger for unintended consequences for nature and for the chances farmers have to make a fair living, a discussion that is of course happening right across this conference. So this more mixed and balanced diet both responds to and drives the move to more mixed and balanced farming landscapes across the UK. So bear with me and I'll stop sharing my screen there. Now, this short summary has, I hope, shown the immense opportunities to tackle the climate, nature and health crises together with a transition to agroecology. But it's all well and good looking at bar charts. Let's hear now from the people who are making these changes on their own land. Johnny, Nick, Luke and Nick, I'm going to ask each of you to speak for no more than five minutes, please. Introducing yourself and your farm, the things you've already done to change and where you're trying to get your farm business to. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be quite strict with time, so apologies if I interrupt. I'll give a 30 second warning uh, to leave time for those smaller group discussions in breakout rooms to follow. Johnny, 
Can I start with you, please? Over to you. Yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm Johnny Balfour from Balboni Home Farms. Uh, we farm in Fife um, in Scotland. Uh, we have a, a pasture for life certified um, beef herd of cattle. We have combinable crops, barley, oats, beans and wheat. Uh, we have vegetables, uh, carrots, kale, potatoes, cauliflower, cabbage, uh, and we have uh, forestry. Um, we've come from a very mainstream farming system. We have been farming with high inputs uh, and what could euphemistically be described as high outputs. Um, we want to, in the future, we want to integrate our enterprises more, uh, reduce our synthetic inputs to zero. Uh, we're very much in transition at the moment from this high output system towards an agroecological system which would um, make sense from the from Jim's presentation a couple of minutes ago. Um, we want to use our livestock as um, fertility builders for our whole system. In the past, our livestock have been uh, split apart and gone to the more marginal bits of the farm and the uh, better land has grown uh, arable crops year after year after year. Uh, we want to bring those livestock back onto our arable land. Um, we also want to increase the diversity of everything we're doing. Uh, we want to want to have different livestock for doing different jobs. Um, we were just talking yesterday in the farm office about getting some sheep, which will be useful um, for uh, taking, um, using the lays differently from the cattle because they're smaller animals, they, they do a different job. Uh, at some point, we would like to have some chickens, some pigs. We could extend that. More diversity is better. Uh, we want to have uh, more diversity in the crops that we're producing. We currently do have um, decent diversity, uh, but it's nowhere near what it can be. We want to have more, um, more diversity within the crops, so more um, companion crops, uh, more diverse mixtures of crops growing, uh, as well as more diverse uh, uh, single crops. So we're diverse, we've got increased diversity both spatially and temporally. Um, we also want to have more uh, different trees for different jobs. We want to have more trees for shelter, we want to have more trees for timber, more trees for fruit, and whatever else it can be. Integrate the livestock into the trees, the trees into the arable, the arable into the livestock, and um, all the others. Um, and we want to have more uh, different people with different skills and interests that will allow our communities to thrive. So I suppose to sum it up in one sentence of what we would like to see in the future is more people growing and eating more uh, locally grown food in our environment. Um, the steps that we need to make in order to make that change. The first step is changing our mindset. We have to want to make the change. Um, and we have to make our decisions um, across the board uh, that positively impact the people, the environment and our finances. And if we can make those decisions that um, positively impact all of our business, um, we can show that nature-friendly farming is business-friendly farming. Wonderful, Johnny. Thank you very much indeed. A wonderful synopsis there. Um, Nick Renison, can I pass over to you now, please? Hi, yeah, can you hear me okay? 
All good. Yes. Okay. Well, um, thank you for this opportunity. So um, I'm Nick Renson and I farm um, in Cumbria with my husband, Renault. Um, we moved here in 2012. It's a um, 360 acre kind of upland farm. Um, and we moved here with a totally conventional mindset. I'm from a, a dairy farm, so I've kind of been brought up with pushing for production all the time. Um, Renault was um, managed a fell farm so when we arrived we were very conventional and then in 2013 we went to see some farmers in Northumberland called the Nellises and they were organic they've got lots of different enterprises and they introduced us to rotational grazing and from that moment really we've always been in some kind of rotation and we learned we had to relearn everything we, we learned how to grow grass we stopped using fertilizer we cut out a lot of our feed um, and all of a sudden we could grow loads of grass and then, then we kind of, that's when the wheels fell off. We were kind of typical farmers, more grass, we need more, more sheep. So we, we, we found ourselves in 2014 with, with um, over a thousand sheep. And what we'd, when I look back now, we'd created a monoculture of sheep. Um, we, we were rearing a few dairy heifers, but we just had sheep. So we, we then had poor growth, lameness, um, high vet spills. And, um, and also we were totally beholden to the commodity market. So we weren't in charge of our own destiny at all. And we were already kind of, because of the rotational grazing, we were already thinking slightly regenerative, regeneratively. Um, and then we became obsessed by Joel Salatin and Richard Perkins, watching lots of YouTube, um, YouTube clips, reading lots of books. And um, the, Charles Massey's book called The Reed Wobbler, um, he, he says, a quote out of that book is that we have become landscape illiterate, which wouldn't have mean, meant a thing to me a while ago, but now I can really, really see um, what, what he was saying. So jump forward to 2022, our farm looks completely different. So we, we like to think that we're stacking enterprises. So currently, if you look back to 2013, 12, when, um, 14, when we had over 1,200 sheep, we've now got 65 suckler cows, 200 ewes, 300 laying hens in an eggmobile. Um, during the summer, we rear uh, pastured table birds, and we've got a couple of pigs, and we've also got a glamping enterprise, very small glamping enterprise. So it's all about stacking the, the um, enterprises and selling locally. So all the pigs and um, chickens and eggs are sold locally um, and we're increasingly selling more of our beef and lamb locally and, and that's really where we want to go um, and we, we now think of ourselves as food producers rather than just farmers we're, we're very much food producers and also um, custodians of the landscape so we want this place to be like a utopia sound staff but that's what we want it to be so I because of where we've come from, I really recognise it's a journey and lots of farmers have invested hundreds of thousands of pounds in infrastructure and, and they, they've, you know, they've, they've done what the governments have wanted them to do and produce food. So I, I recognise it's a journey. Everyone's on a different place on that journey. But I think what we need to do is if we get the consumers on side and start telling the truth about how food is produced. And if you see, I was in Sainsbury's yesterday and there was a £3.20 chicken. And there's a reason why that £3.20 chicken is £3.20. And it's, we've got to understand the true cost of that food. So yeah, I, I, think, I think that's me done. I'm worried about time, but that's me done in a, in a whistle stop tour. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful, Nick. Thank you so much. You've covered uh, unbelievable ground there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Luke, can I pass over to you now, please? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, hi, yeah, my name's Luke Wilson. Um, uh, my background really is I, I grew up on a mixed um, organic farm near Tetbury where my dad was the farm manager and he did everything, tried pretty hard to persuade me not to get into agriculture. And then I listened briefly, which is a first, uh, and went and got another job and then uh, have gradually found my way back uh, into farming which is what I absolutely love doing and then for various reasons we sort of moved farm we're now up in uh, Lower Swell Gloucestershire um, and I'm farming here with my dad and my brother um, and we are uh, 
So we're farming about 700 acres here at our uh, main farm, um, which is organic. It's been organic for about a year and a half. And then we're farming another 1,000 acres, um, six miles up the road, which has just um, gone from very bog standard, conventional, what I describe as a sort of rape wheat farm, um, not a lot of soil. And that's in its just gone into its second year of um, conversion and is really changing, which is um, very exciting. Uh, and then in terms of what we're actually farming, so we've got quite a lot of um, uh, enterprises in their sort of infancy, I guess, but we've got um, about uh, 600 sheep. Um, and then we have put, just recently put a milking parlor back in this farm here, where I am sat now was originally a milking um, farm. So we put the parlor back in and we are milking some red pole cattle. Um, with the idea to sell that milk direct to our local customers. So we're currently um, putting in a processing room to be able to sell some milk. Uh, and then we've got about 80 suckler cows, um, predominantly Sussex, uh, and a few Herefords. Um, and what else are we doing? And then we are, um, my dad has for a long time been sort of champion of um, heritage grains. So we, we um, uh, at the moment, growing about 200 acres of various um, heritage uh, grains, which uh, plan at some point this year is to start being able to mill a bit and sell flour direct to people. Because we've, we've very much got an emphasis on simple processing. So we want to sell milk, which is sort of, sort of basic product, requires not much effort to get it into something which is worth a bit more and then sell it into our local um, customers. And then it's the same with our heritage grains. Um, and we've got um, quite a few pigs now um, and really been experimenting with uh, their feed. So we've managed to get them onto a diet of totally homegrown grains. So we get either barley or oats and uh, whey and they grow fantastically well on it. And we've been doing quite a bit of um, sort of strip grazing with them because pigs will actually eat a surprising amount of forage if you move them enough. Um, we've managed to get them trained onto one strand of electric fence, which for anyone who does electric fencing, is um, that's one of the highlights of the year actually. Uh, and the product we've been getting off, off them is really fantastic. Like the, the, the bacon we've had is, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And then we experimented with a handful of turkeys, which was uh, good. Uh, so, um, and then we also sell quite a lot of um, wood chip um, to local, biomass boilers um, and that's also been quite an interesting experiment because we get some of the wood chip is not a good enough grade to be able to sell to for biomass boilers so we've been experimenting with mixing it with manure and things like that and actually trying to put that back on the ground which you get some um, pretty fantastic product um, so yeah and that's that's pretty much us and the only thing I'd emphasize um, with all of this is that uh, it's for me. It's all about the people. Uh, the, the better you have people that really are passionate about farming in a certain kind of way, you can achieve an awful lot. And there, there are opportunities to to farm in this way. And then, yeah, that's us really. Thank you so much, Luke. I mean, that's remarkable the amount of stuff you've got going there in, a, in you know what is a very short space of time. So, thank you, thank you for covering that so uh, so closely and and, and well. Um, Luke, uh, sorry, Nick Francis, last up. Can I pass over to you now, please? Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm Nick from Paddock Farm. Um, I'm a first generation farmer and set up Paddock Farm in about 2008 with my brother. Um, Paddock Farm's now home to around about 40 sow uh, herd of Tamworth pigs, uh, about 120 head of uh, grass fed beef cattle. Um, an egg laying enterprise in, a, in an egg mobile, not dissimilar to Nick Frenson's, and a no dig market garden. Um, we uh, manage around about 200 acres. Um, and we've also got a butchery business which runs alongside the farm and gives us a route to market for all of our produce um, and also enables us to link up with some other farms and suppliers. Um, the butchery business is both a retail shop and a direct to restaurant supply and we deliver out to restaurants um, around Cotswolds, Birmingham and London 
um, and we've got a really good support. We're really lucky. We link up with around about 70 restaurants, um, supply a couple of dozen Michelin starred chefs. And so we've, we're really lucky to have some good contacts on that front now. Um, as I said, we're first generation. So we started out purely with Tamworth pigs and we start, started out with a fairly simple aim. We just wanted to produce the ultimate pork. Um, but we did want to do this in a manner that was sympathetic to the environment and paid respect to the live animals and the carcasses. Um, and as our farm grew and we came across people, um, and many of these people have already been mentioned, so Joel Salatin, Gabe Brown, Charles Massey. Um, interestingly, we, we uh, came across some of these people at uh, Lower Swell, where Luke is um, now farming, um, at the Sustainable Food Trust conference that was hosted there. Um, we, we just began to ask ourselves how we can fit pigs into a regenerative farming system. Um, and we're nowhere near the end point, but we've made quite a few changes over the last two or three years, um, which I'll talk about. So the first thing that became clear to us, and interestingly, Johnny mentioned this as one of his key points, was we needed more diversity. Um, it didn't seem possible to um, incorporate regenerative farming principles and a focus on soil health um, with just a simple pig grass rotation, which is what we've been working on. Um, we felt that we had to bring in um, other species of plants and animals. And this le led us to the, uh, the magic of herbal lays and um, mixed pastures and uh, mob grazing cattle. Um, as I'm sure many of the audience here will be familiar, um, raising cattle on pasture can just create such an amazing series of mutually beneficial relationships, um, improving soil, benefiting nature, drawing down carbon, which has been really exciting to, to be involved in. And then uh, just last year, we introduced the Eggmobile to follow the cattle. And again, uh, you can just uh, run into this amazing series of, uh, of mutual, mutually beneficial um, knock-on effects, which has been amazing to see. We did also, though, feel that we had to reduce the stocking density of our pigs. So um, we had got an 80 sow herd of Tamworth pigs, um, which is, is a good size for a Tamworth herd. Commercially, it's still very, very small. Um, but I think in hindsight, we we're potentially pushing the carrying capacity of our land slightly. Um, so now we're taking a bit of a different approach where we're trying for most of the year to keep all of our pigs above ground um, stocking them lightly, um, moving them regularly, and trying to really maximise their intake of standing forage. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're managing both permanent pastures and herbal lays through mob grazing cattle um, and pigs following where possible with an eggmobile. Um, it's important to say the cattle and pigs are grazed separately and on separate ground and the, and the pigs are all, all on a, a herbal lay. Uh, we're not quite brave enough to run them across the permanent pasture yet. Um, and I won't go into the detail of the pig, pig mob grazing, but uh, interestingly, Luke mentioned uh, getting pigs trained a single strand of electric fence. We've done exactly the same, and it's been a complete game changer. We're using Kiwi Tech temporary fencing, single strands, moving the pigs every two days, which has been really interesting. Um, so we're aiming to uh, feed the soils, improve the soils, um, produce as much forage as we can. Economically, obviously, this makes sense, um, but ecologically, it's really exciting too. And we believe- 30 seconds there, the Nick, sorry, just 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay, okay. Sorry. So, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you some, some re of the really exciting things we've got ecologically, um, which are really, really easy to pull out. Um, so if you're doing soil testing, mob grazing pigs for a single year across an eight acre field. Um, we've increased the organic matter in that soil. And I know we have to be careful jumping to conclusions after just one year, but it's gone from 9% uh, to 11%, um, which according to the Farm Carbon Toolkit can amount to a carbon sink of around about 200 tonnes of CO2 equivalent in a single year, which I know we have to be careful pulling out single years and single fields, but really interesting the potential for not just um, mob grazing cattle, but also pigs and chickens and whatnot. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up. Go on. That's fantastic, you. Nick. Thank you so much. And sorry to sorry to have interrupted. And and thank you all um, 
there's so much to learn from and discuss in those four uh, short synopses. Um, but let's take these discussions now uh, into breakout rooms. Uh, I think that Nick uh, Renison and maybe Nick Francis as well may have to head off to join another session shortly. So thank you both for joining us today if you do, and, and hopefully you'll be able to spend some time in, in the breakouts as well. Now we've set up three rooms to discuss what sustainable futures look like on three different farming landscapes, uplands, grasslands and lowland arable. Now the irony of this, of course, uh, is that the move to more mixed farms means we need to move away uh, from thinking about certain landscapes in terms of one dominant type of, of farming, arable, for example. But the routes we need to map out are also different for these different landscapes, including also different business contexts and ownership models. In fact, they probably involve, as we've just heard, a, a unique set of circumstances for every single farm. And, and this is where we'd like to hear from you on those questions I open with. What does the future of farming look like in your region? Where do farms and farm businesses need to get to for a thriving, sustainable future in your place? That's question one. What tools and resources do farmers need that they don't currently have to achieve this? And how would these work across different kinds and sizes of enterprise? That's question two. And what can farmers do that they're not already doing to make the necessary changes? Question three. Now, these will be copied into the chat, these questions in each breakout room. And, and this is really your chance you know, to, to, to help us answer these questions and, and to share your own experiences. Uh, a member of our team will introduce and chair the discussion, Hannah Field in Uplands, John Woods in Grasslands and Vicente Masiak-Kier in Lowland Arable. Our panelists will be joining these rooms and, you know, though this is not really meant as a Q&A, they'll be on hand to lend their considerable expertise. In terms of admin, uh, please raise your hand for when you'd like to speak and you'll find that on the reactions tab at the bottom uh, of your browser. Uh, we'd like to hear from everyone, so please also put your comments in the chat uh, if you don't have the chance uh, to speak. And there'll be a post-event uh, meetup on Hoover as well, and, and there'll be another chance to add comments there. So I think the rooms are open now. Uh, we've got 20 minutes uh, for these discussions, so um, you should see a box inviting you to join one of the rooms. Uh, please choose the discussion which interests you most and, and where you'd like to hear more about the changes required and to which you'd most like to contribute. Thank you. I can see people joining, so it seems to be seems to be working. You should have the uh, the box in front of you on the on the Zoom screen and the ability to to choose the room, uplands, grasslands, or lowland arable, um, in front of you. For those who've just entered the waiting room and have just joined, we're uh, currently moving into breakout rooms to discuss the sort of future of future of farming on three different landscapes, uplands, um, grasslands and lowland arable. And we're looking to answer some, some particular questions and we're looking for your thoughts on these as well. So what does the future of farming look like in your region? Um, where do farms and farm businesses need to get to for a thriving, sustainable future in your place? What tools and resources do farmers need that they don't currently have to achieve this? And how would these work across different kinds and sizes of enterprise? And what can farmers do that they're not already doing to make the necessary changes? So you will see, hopefully, on the screen in front of you, three different options. You can join the Uplands breakout room, the Grasslands breakout room, or the Lowland Arable breakout room. Please choose the, the session which you know appeals to you most and uh, to which you'd most like to contribute. So, Jim, I think there are a few people still um, still in this main room who may not necessarily want to join a breakout room. We can always run through the questions with them here, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Good idea. Um, so, yeah, if you are in this room and you haven't yet joined a breakout um, and, yeah, you'd like to you have any thoughts on any of those any of those questions, as I said, that I open with, please feel free to. Feel free to share your views and, and to tell us tell us what you think and uh, how you how you're going. I'll, rem I'll remind you of those those questions. Um, yeah, James just put them in the chat. What does the future of farming look like in your region? What tools and resources do farmers need that they don't currently have to achieve this? And what can farmers do that they're not already doing to make the necessary changes? And I appreciate this is a, a kind of very UK centric session. So it may be that, you know, you're, you're joining from a from another part of the world and and you'd like to talk about, you know, and, and, and contribute with the, the future of 
what a farm looks like and, and what farms look like in the region where you are somewhere else in the world in which case please I'd, I'd love to hear love to hear what you have to say but if not that's also fine too and the breakout people from the breakouts will be joining this session again for the last 10 minutes or so uh, at which point we'll hear a quick synopsis of the discussion from each of those breakout rooms and uh, I'll, I'll wrap up as well and, and also um, nod to the other opportunities there will be throughout the year and indeed throughout the conference to contribute uh, to these discussions as well. Okay welcome back hopefully everyone's now filing back in uh, to the main room and I, I'm really sorry but I had to cut those as I did and I'm sure those discussions were in, in full flow but hopefully uh, beginning to get into some of those some of those questions and um, I, I'd like to ask uh, the breakout room facilitators now um, to talk us briefly through the key takeouts from their discussions um, starting with Hannah Field. Hannah can I can I go to you first? Um, Hannah was leading the session uh, discussing farming in the uplands. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, and Maddie, she was taking notes as well. So if you've got anything to add, um, feel free. But I'll, we didn't really stick to the questions very much, but they we could slot the answers in. I think that's that's fine. Um, <laughs> but basically, I think the broad kind of vision that was coming through was looking to moving towards more mixed farm enterprises and um, those stacking stacking of enterprises, which has come up a lot. Um, and the common theme being uh, increasing the diversity of, of farm businesses um, and the, the functions within those farm businesses, essentially. Um, and some of the, the big challenges which are around that um, came up quite a lot. So having to do a, a whole mindset change, which again has been spoken about before. Um, the fact that there's a lot of farms which are locked in to certain contracts and loans and having to pay back. So making sure that it all adds up is, is obviously really important. Um, and there was looking in terms of resources and what resources are needed. Um, one of the things that came up was the need for local infrastructure and local skills. So specifically, um, Jane was given the example of on Orkney where they lost their local abattoir, which completely halted the diversification, which had started to happen into say rare breed pork um, because it just didn't stack up and um, had to track, take your animals like onto the mainland 150 miles away to get them um, to an abattoir. And then Nick, um, there's only one local butcher that can really meet the needs of, of um, her type of farm business. Um, so that need for infrastructure and skills is really important in terms of resources. Um, and then, yeah, kind of just getting more people onto the land connected with that and getting and a last comment from Harriet which was cut short a little bit um, was around more farmers more farming enterprises in one landscape and just more people on the land more broadly yeah yeah thank you thank you so much Hannah and Harriet I'm sorry for cutting short your your point um John John Woods can I turn to you now please John was um handling the discussion on grasslands Yes, th thanks, Jim. Well, I keep this this it's pretty brief. I guess we we start and actually Alison was taking notes. Alison, please do come in with um, anything that you think we should cover that I've missed, which I probably, I probably will have missed quite a lot. Um, so um, we started off with a question on, on kind of species rich uh, meadows on floodplains, and that, that um, and that, that I think the question was really around you know obviously these got biodiversity value, but how does it work into the kind of agricultural systems and and uh, in terms of productivity and so on or production, and um, and then we talked a little bit more about grass and multi species swords and the potential. I think there's quite a lot of uh, interest there in, in how um, all that works and um, the potential for mob grazing. We'd heard from from Nick about the mob grazing of pigs, and. Um, and then that discussion led into, you know, just the, the, the clear value and ambition that you know, we need much more mixed systems. And if you've got the opportunity to mix uh, your livestock and, and arable production, um, I guess I pointed out from a kind of a parochial point of view being here in Northern Ireland, there's a particular challenge around that. You've got very small farms that are only doing beef or, um, uh, or, or only, only doing uh, 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 sheep or whatever. So it's, um, 
Um, but then there's a scope for collaboration between farms as well. And we had an example of that. Um, so I think, you know, endorsement of that kind of mixed approach. Um, but um, I won't say that we address those three questions in detail and I can come up with uh, specific answers. And Alison, if you've got anything to add, please do, do leap in. Well, just to say the, um, the point about abattoirs on islands, I think the Isle of Wight was mentioned um, in the chat as well, which, which is interesting. Indeed. Fantastic. Thank you both ever so much. And um, absolutely, those questions meant as a guide rather than as a hard and fast three to address. So fantastic that the conversations went off in the in the directions in which they needed to. And, and thank you, John and Alison, for summer, summarising that on Grasslands. Vicente, last but not least, uh, Vicente was hosting the uh, Lowlands Arable um, discussion. Vicente, can I ask you for a sort of two minute synopsis, please? Yes, we were really no better behaved in Arable. Uh, the questions were just sort of left behind. I'm so sorry. Uh, so Stephen kicked us off with this insight that sort of Arable is uh, both exciting and kind of overwhelming uh, in that it's where most of the intensification has perhaps been seen since the Second World War. And so a lot of these uh, modern practices in agriculture seem most entrenched and sort of difficult to uh, see a way out of. Um, and the indomitable Johnny uh, came through with his just do it motto stolen from Nike. You know, he says now is as good a time as any to try and integrate uh, animals onto your, into your rotations with high fertilizer prices. And um, he also stressed the importance of sort of peer to peer learning as well um, in, you know, trying and failing. So that was really valuable. But what also came out was this importance of um, support, not just in terms of, uh, uh, you know, elms and, and these sorts of uh, subsidies or incentives, but actually finding out how we can uh, make regulations uh, sort of make sense. So uh, Chris Molyneux, uh, vegetable farmer, mentioned that he can't use farm farmyard manure or graze animals within 12 months of growing the veg uh, that he grows on his land. Uh, so now he's looking at ways of fertilizing with herbal lays. Um, and Yes, another point on entrenchment, which I thought was important, uh, was uh, James Woodward from Sustain uh, just coming in to talk about how uh, commodity markets and supermarket pricing um, can, can be really uh, uh, limiting or dampening for, for sort of uh, movements towards change and how we need to, you know, get onto government to, to break that vicious cycle. And that's my two minutes. Uh, there was a lot more, uh, but I... Sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you, I, Vicente. I, I, no, that's fantastic. Great synopsis, and, and thank you very much. And and thank you all. Uh, some fascinating insights into the different tools, resources, and pathways required across the different farming landscapes of the UK for farm businesses to move to a more sustainable future. Now, I'd like to extend an invitation to carry on feeding in your thoughts to this process over the coming year. I know many of you haven't had the chance to share your views on this today, and. This is a collective participatory effort to really get into how and with what resources farms can transition and to understand what actions farms need to take and what tools they need to help them do it and what that future looks like at a farm level. Understanding these actions, of course, means talking to those already taking them, as we have today, and as well as talking to those who maybe haven't taken any yet. And this is our work for the coming year. And there'll be plenty more opportunities to contribute to this. So please do look out for those. Follow us on Twitter, sign up to our newsletter, drop us an email. We'll be heading over now to our post-event meetup in the Hoover app. So please do join us for, from, for half an hour. If you have more to contribute, you'll be able to leave comments there too in the hours and days ahead. Um, we'll share the link now in the chat. But for now, I'd like to thank you all for coming and for contributing to the discussion. Uh, thank you, of course, to our wonderful panelists, Johnny Balfour, Nick Renison, Luke Wilson, and Nick Francis, and to those holding the breakout rooms, Vicente Masia Kier, John Woods, and Hannah Field. And of course, thank you to the wonderful ORFC organizers uh, for having us and who've done a remarkable job getting us all online at such short notice. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and I look forward to seeing you all in uh, more Zoom boxes over the next couple of days or on Hoover shortly. Farewell for now. Thank you. <laughs>